please be seated. A series called Hope as an Anchor, taken straight out of the biblical text. But before we jump into the sermon today, I just want to take a moment to give a shout out to our ministry team and to all of our ministry leaders who are doing such a phenomenal job of adapting and innovating and, and taking the twist in the road that they continue to come up against. It's just so amazing to be a part of a church where the ministries just continue when there are so many limitations and obstacles and restrictions. And so I am so thankful, as I know you are, for our ministry team and for every ministry leader out there that is continuing to find ways to continue ministry and service. And I think it's a good reminder to all of us that, yes, obstacles do come our way. There are challenges. There are limitations. There always will be. But that doesn't mean the work of God stops. It doesn't mean the people of God stop being the people of God. And the people of God are called to be doers. They're called to be active. And so I am so thankful to be a part of a church family that takes that calling very seriously. So please keep it up. Find encouragement and continue to do what you're doing. It is good to be a part of this church family. If you have a Bible, you might open it up to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 will be our text today. I think our classes, our adult classes, will get to Romans 8 pretty soon. Uh, it is just a, an incredible chapter in the New Testament. It is just bursting with good theology, with eternal truths, and for the sake of our series, it is filled with hope, messages of hope. It's a great way to find hope, to spend some time in Romans chapter 8. My guess is that most people here have experienced the eager anticipation of Christmas Eve. Maybe you can remember as a child, or maybe some of you children know right now, or maybe some of you adults know what it feels like even right now, to have that excitement, that anticipation. It's Christmas Eve, you can't wait until Christmas morning, and so you, you try to go to bed early, so it'll come faster, but you can't sleep very well because you're so excited. Probably you know that experience. Parents, you know that you've seen it among your kids. You probably know the excitement and the eager anticipation of waking up Christmas morning to see what's under the tree. But do you know the eager anticipation and excitement of waking up to see if there's an armadillo in your live animal trap? You weren't expecting that, were you? You see, that has been my life over the past several weeks. That has been what I have been looking forward to every morning to see if there's an armadillo in our live animal trap. Let me explain. Do y'all hear that audio? I don't know what that is. I don't know. So here's the story. We have an armadillo that is tearing up our yard. I mean, it is causing all kinds of damage in our flower beds, in our yard, making divots like this, dozens and dozens of divots throughout our yard. Here's a close-up of what it looks like. Those are everywhere. And I know it's an armadillo because that's what Google told me. And I know you can trust Google. But we also got visual confirmation. We saw the armadillo. It was the morning that we were going for my arm surgery. We had to leave the house at 5.30 a.m. So I'm backing out of the driveway. It's pitch dark. My headlights are on. I'm backing out of the driveway, and that's when we see it, the little prehistoric rodent rooting around in the front of our house just off the edge of the driveway where it curved. And that's when my normally caring and composed wife said, hit it! <laughs> hit it! I mean, it was like an episode of the Swamp People. I felt like I was in the boat tracking the gator, and she's saying, hit it! Hit it! And let me clarify, by hit it, I don't think my sweet wife meant to kill it. I think she meant just slightly graze it, enough to send it a message. 
And so I slammed on the brakes, threw it into drive, and launched our 2,000-pound missile right at that little armadillo. <laughs> and as I am turning the wheel and trying to keep the car off of two wheels, I see our neighbor's headlights pull out of his driveway. <laughs> Evidently, he was having surgery, too. After all, why would you be out at 5.30 in the morning if you weren't having surgery, right? And so I know when he saw us, I, couldn't, I doubt he saw the armadillo, but I know when he saw us screeching around our driveway, he probably thought, yep, my assumption is confirmed. They are crazy, crazy neighbors. But I always want to be friendly to our neighbors. I couldn't tell if he could see me or not, but I waved at him just in case. Hey, how you doing? We're okay. We're not crazy. We're trying to hit an armadillo with a car at... Sounds crazy, but that's what we're doing. Well, the armadillo zigged, and I zagged, and I missed him. And so we tried more traditional methods. I borrowed a live animal trap. And I had to look online to see what you put as bait in these traps. This trap is a little cage. It has doors on both ends. It has a little trigger in the middle inside. You put the bait in there. The little critter steps on it. The doors close, and you have your animal trapped. So I looked online. What do you use for bait to trap an armadillo? I had no idea. Go back to Google. We can depend on Google. Google says, lizards, spiders, scorpions, insects. Honey, where do we keep the scorpions? I didn't know. But it also said rotten fruit, and so I took a mushy black banana, and I put it inside the cage, and we set the cage, and we put it out in the yard. And I couldn't wait until the next morning. I mean, it was like Christmas Eve. I could not wait because I just knew. I just knew there'd be an armadillo in the trap. So I go out in the morning to check, the bait is gone. In fact, the banana peel, the black banana peel, is still in the cage. The doors are still wide open. Ah. And so I, the next night, set the trap again. Night after night after night, setting this trap. I decided to get a little bit innovative with the bait. I tried peanut butter. I don't know, someone said peanut butter. I tried a marshmallow, one of those giant marshmallows. Evidently, they don't like marshmallows. Who doesn't like marshmallows? So every morning, when I eagerly anticipated catching this armadillo, I would go out to check the trap, and it was either empty with the bait gone, or there was a possum in the trap. I caught five possums. I'm not kidding you, five possums. One morning, I got up, the bait was gone, the doors were still open, so I got the trap, put it up on the back porch because I didn't want it to get wet in the sprinklers. There was no bait in it. It was right by the back door, right on the porch, and I had I'd forgotten to put it out that night, so the next morning, I'm walking in the house, I look out the window to the back porch, and lo and behold, there is a possum in the trap on the back porch. There was no bait in there. It was right by the back door. And that little possum's just kind of looking at me with that possum face like, yeah, I know I'm an idiot. I don't know. <laughs> I lost a bet. <laughs> I will tell you, though, in case you're concerned, all the possums, most of the possums have been relocated <laughs> to an undisclosed location in part of what I like to call the PPP, the Possum Protection Program. <laughs> and so don't worry, they're all safe. But I got to tell you, it's been frustrating because I am trying to catch this armadillo that is killing and destroying our yard. And every morning I go out there and it's either nothing or a possum. That silly story reminds me of a great and disappointing truth in life. And that is that anticipation often dissolves into disappointment. Doesn't it? I mean... Life in this world teaches us that lesson over and over again. And just in case we might forget it, what does it do? Life reinforces it. We have expectations. We have hopes and dreams. We look forward to things, and we think things will be a certain way. And what happens? Disappointment. We're let down. Our dreams are unfulfilled. Our expectations are unmet. And we encounter disappointment. It's just the way life seems to be so often. But as Christians, our story is different. You see, as Christians, we anticipate a future reality, a reality that far exceeds this reality, 
a reality where there is no pain, there is no frustration, there is no disease, no virus, no conflict, no chaos. And so we eagerly anticipate that reality. And we know in our heart of hearts that we won't be disappointed because our hope is in Jesus. And so we can count on the promises of God. Our anticipation won't be met with defeat or disappointment. It will be met with assurance and fulfillment. And that's what keeps us going. That is the hope in which our souls are anchored, firm and secure. But sometimes, although we know it, we forget it. Sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes things compete for our attention our minds, our hearts, our pursuits, and we forget. Scripture speaks directly into that struggle, and I think Romans 8 is one of the best places. Romans 8, verse 18, Paul writes, I consider it, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Underline that verse, commit it to memory. Let me read it again. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Verse 19, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Do you understand what Paul is saying? You need to incorporate this into your worldview, into your thinking. He says, if you take some scales, some of those old-fashioned scales, and on one side you put all the sufferings and all the disappointment and all the struggles of life, but then on the other side you put the future glory that will be revealed in Christ. He said, if you do that, the scales won't teeter in indecision. They won't stall wondering which side do we commit to. He says, every time they will slam down on the side of future glory in Christ. Every single time. He says, there's no comparison. Whatever you're going through, he says, it is, it is light. It is momentary compared to the future glory that we have in Christ. And he doesn't say this to dismiss our struggles. I think that's important. Paul is not saying that, well, you should just, you know, dismiss whatever struggles you're having. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't say it to minimize our circumstances or our struggles. He says it to give us perspective. And we need perspective. Because it is so easy to get caught up in the dealings of this world. What's happening? What might happen? What will happen? What will happen if this doesn't happen what I'm going through, what I need, what I want, all of those things. Those things are pressing, they are urgent, and you know the saying, sometimes they crowd out what? The important, the eternal. So we need perspective, and Paul gives it to us. And the phrase used here for present or present time, it literally means now for a limited period of time. Whatever you're going through, whatever we are going through, it will be only for a season. Now, for a limited period of time. And that's why Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, that these troubles are light and momentary. And they are achieving for us this eternal glory that far, what, outweighs them. Back to the scales. Every time you put your struggles our struggles, our circumstances on one side, and you put the future glory that we will experience in Christ, the scale will tip that side every time. It far outweighs them all, he says. Again, he's not dismissing your circumstances or your struggles or your grief or your problems when he says they are light and momentary. He is simply saying that relative to what is to come to give us perspective. So back in Romans 8, verse 19, he mentions this eager anticipation that we talked about before. Like an anxious child on Christmas Eve. And actually the word here, it literally mean, means to crane one's neck so as to get a better view of something. To crane one's neck. I mean, you can almost imagine that child. I remember as a child, you know, it was Christmas morning. 
Back then, my dad would have the, the, the old V8 or what was I can't remember, 8mm camera with the hunting light on it. You know, it was so bright. And he'd march us kids into the room next to the room where the Christmas tree was. And I remember going by the Christmas tree room. You would try to get a glimpse in there to see if you could see anything under the tree. That's the image Paul uses here. This eager anticipation, this expectation, this craning your neck to see what is to come. Back in our text, Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Man, there's a lot of groaning going on in this verse, isn't there? I think it's because there's a lot of groaning going on in our world. I mean, think about the last eight or ten months. The groanings have been reverberating through our world. There's so much going on, revealing the the fallenness, the brokenness of our world. And Paul says, everyone is groaning. Creation is groaning. We are groaning. Everyone is groaning. You go back to Genesis 3 and you see why. Adam and Eve rebel against God. They choose their own path rather than God's path. And when they do that, the ground was cursed and sin corrupted the world. And creation began living out a much different story than God intended. The groaning began. And Paul says it this way in verse 20. Creation was subjected to what? Frustration. Creation was subjected to frustration. And in this verse, this phrase means the inability to accomplish or achieve what was intended. I mean, think about that for a moment. That can be frustrating. When you buy a tool or you grab a tool for a job and it doesn't do the job it's supposed to do, that's frustrating. When you buy a vehicle and you drive around and all of a sudden it stops running, that's what it's supposed to do. That's frustrating. When you take medicine and it doesn't work, that's frustrating. One of these days, Lord willing, if we get a vaccine and let's say we all start taking it and then it stops working. You talk about frustration. He says that's the condition of our world. It's in a constant state of frustration because it's not living out the story that God intended. It's not fulfilling its intended purpose. I mean, think about that for a minute. We have incredible advances in medicine, and yet millions of people die from cancer and other diseases. We have, through technology, this global community so connected, and yet loneliness and isolation and anxiety seem to be at an all-time high. We have nations with state-of-the-art defense systems, and yet this world feels unsafe, and we sometimes feel insecure. All of the advances, all of the knowledge, all of the progress, and yet there are still pandemics. There are still violent acts. There is still hatred. There is still chaos. Mental health isn't where we would like for it to be. Physical health isn't where we want it to be. There's relational pain. Creation has been subjected to frustration. And we hear the groans of creation because it's not fulfilling its original purpose. But we aren't just viewers of these groanings. Paul says we are participants. We are fellow participants because we have been subjected to this creation, this fallen creation, and because we ourselves are broken and fallen. So you put all that together. We sin. We make bad choices. We live in a world that has fallen, that is broken. There is a lot of groaning going on. But then the passage takes this decisive turn. Groaning is necessary sometimes, even biblical. 
Look at the Psalms. We call them the Psalms of Lament. These heart-wrenching cries to the Lord. And it's okay. God can handle your cries of injustice and pain. But sometimes we get caught in the loop of lament. And all we do is complain about the world and complain about how things are and complain about what is to come. And Paul says, it's okay to lament. We're all groaning. But learn to look up. As we said last week, look through your circumstances to see what is to come. Because remember the scales? Whatever you're going through, whatever's happening, the future glory that will be revealed in Christ far outweighs it all. And so he says, learn to look up, look through the lament, look beyond the groans, and see this future reality. You see, we have this hope. We have this hope that Paul talks about. And I'm so thankful he talks about it. Back in the text, verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. He says all of creation is groaning. And he compares it to the labor pains of childbirth. Some of you know that firsthand, don't you? The whole process of pregnancy, the sickness, the cravings, the back aches, the exhaustion. I, I remember. And then there's all the stuff the expecting mother goes through, too. I mean, But you know, most parents I know, and most ladies I know who are moms, you might ask them, was that difficult? Yeah. Was it painful? Absolutely. Was it worth it? Without a doubt. You see, most moms, most parents I know say, we're willing to do that. It wasn't pleasant, it wasn't good, but we're willing to do that because that doesn't compare that doesn't compare to the arrival, to the birth of this child, this blessing from God. How do you even compare the two? Of course we'll go through that, is what most moms would say. Of course, because look at this blessing. And Paul uses that same image to say, hang on, there's hope. Anticipate what is to come, because once you have it, You'll look back, if we have the ability to look back, and we'll say, man, I, I didn't enjoy going through those things, but they were light. They were momentary. They were for a season. And Paul says, we have this hope. He reminds us that our full identity as children of God, as sons and daughters of the King, will be fully realized in this new reality, in this future existence, eternity that we look forward to. Our bodies are going to be redeemed. Creation is going to be renewed. Finally, finally, life will be lived as it was always intended. You see, here's the good news. Here's what I want you to know. That one day, all of our groanings will be overwhelmed by glory. I think that's what Paul is saying here. Because God intervened on our behalf, because he sent Jesus to this earth to live and to die, and he brought him out of that tomb, he conquered death, we have hope. And remember, when we talk about hope in the biblical sense, it's not wishful thinking, it is this bold and blessed assurance that is tethered to the promises of God. As he points out, no one hopes for something they already have that doesn't work. You hope for what is to come, and we know what is to come. As people of faith, we know that God wins and that we overcome. He will make good on his promises. So hope does not elude us. It doesn't disappoint us. We have this hope as an anchor 
for our soul, firm and secure. But when will it happen? That's the question. When will it happen? If all of this is just for a season, it is, it is now for a limited time, when will this future reality become the present reality? We don't know. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that regarding the day and the hour, no one knows the time. Not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but only the Father. So we don't know. So what do we do? We wait. We wait. But how do we wait? We wait in patient hope. That's how we wait. We wait in patient hope. The same way a child waits for Christmas morning. The same way expecting parents wait for the birth of their child. The same way the world held its breath and stood on its toes and craned its neck to look into that empty tomb of Jesus. We wait in patient hope. James Edwards said, Our present sufferings are not the final cries in an empty universe, but the prelude of joy at the final liberation. I like that. If we keep reading in Romans 8, we're going to see that there are more groanings. This time, the Spirit is groaning, and it's a different kind of groaning. Back in the text, verse 26, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That's an important phrase. Not in accordance to our wills, but the will of God. Verse 28. You know this verse. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, the Spirit of God within us groans for us to God. The Spirit of God in us groans for us. We have all of our groanings because we live in a fallen world and we go through difficult things and the Spirit of God takes those groanings and translates them into heavenly groans. A heavenly language, the language of heaven as he intercedes and approaches God on our behalf. The Spirit in us groans for us when we pray. How's your prayer life? That phrase, prayer life, I'm not a big fan of, actually, because our lives should be about prayer. It should just be life. So how have you been praying lately? Is it time to to give your prayers a boost? Is it time to lift some of those groanings up to the Spirit and let Him translate those groans into the heavenly groans for God? Prayer is so important. We all know that, and yet so often we get so distracted and so busy, we don't pause to pray. We want to be a praying people. So let me tell you about something coming up in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Saturday, November 14th, an outdoor prayer service, a time of hope and healing. We're going to go to the north parking lot, and if the weather's nice, bring your camp chairs. If it's not, or if you prefer, stay inside your vehicle. We'll have a place for vehicles. We'll have a place for chairs if the weather's nice. We're working on transmitted audio so that you can sit in your car and, and hear what's happening, kind of like at a drive, drive-in movie, I guess. Maybe on your radio or your phone. We're still working on that. And we're going to spend some time praying for our nation praying for our community, praying for our congregation in light of everything that is happening and that will continue to happen over the next couple of weeks. We want the Spirit to search our hearts and our minds and to intercede on our behalf. Afterwards, we're going to have some fire pits out, and so if you want to roast marshmallows, you can. You know, I have a few left over from the trap. I can bring those. It'll just be a good time of being together, being in the presence of God, and praying together. I hope that you will mark your calendars and plan to be a part of that. To wait 
patiently in hope does not mean to wait passively. Just as we we read a minute ago, verse 28, in all things God is at work for our good. Just as God is at work in all things, we need to be at work for the glory of God. It's so easy just to sit on our hands and look around and, and lament and complain. That's not the calling of God's people. We are to use our hands to serve, to be active. This is not a passive waiting. It is a patient waiting, but it's not passive. There is work to be done, the work of God. Yes, there are obstacles. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are limitations. But the work of God does not stop, and we don't stop being the people of God. And so if you've taken a break, that's fine, but it's time to get to work. And I don't even know what that looks like. And maybe you don't even know what that looks like. But it can start with prayer. And God will reveal to you the work he wants you to do. The plans he has for you. So don't sit on your hands. Use your hands. Speaking of anticipation and expectation for Christmas, I heard this story. It's a, it's a crazy story. Back in 1970, 50 years ago, There was a young man, 17-year-old, in Montreal named Adrian. And he had a girlfriend named Vicky. And it was almost Christmas time, and they were dating, and Vicky gave Adrian a little Christmas present. He took it home, and he put it under the Christmas tree. Well, a few days later, Vicky broke up with Adrian. And so he had this gift under the tree. Christmas came, and he didn't open the gift. I would have been so curious, what's the gift? What did she give me before she broke up with me? (laughs) He didn't open the gift. Next year, Christmas came around. You know what he did? He put that gift under the tree again, but he didn't open it. He did that year after year after year. He ended up getting married. He married another lady, and he would still put that gift under the tree. How would you like that, ladies? (laughs) She wasn't too fond of it either, but then it just sort of became family tradition, so she got on board with it. They had kids. And he would continue to put that gift under the tree. His kids were like, open the gift, open it, let's see what's inside. I mean, the curiosity was killing them. They had this anticipation, this expectation, but he would not open the gift. But it was always under the tree every year. And then in 2018, two years ago, it's been almost 50 years, 48 years, he decides he's ready to open the gift. So he posts something on Facebook, and wouldn't you know it, The ex-girlfriend from high school sees it. you got to love Facebook. (laughs) And they reconnect. Again, I'm thinking, what's this wife thinking? (laughs) They reconnect, and they decide they're going to open the gift. And they actually do it as a part of a fundraiser for a local charity, and they make a big deal of it. And they open the present after 48 years. I hope it wasn't something edible, right? Now, I'm really tempted to keep going with the sermon and not tell you what was in the gift. You see, that's that anticipation. That's that curiosity that Paul is talking about here. Live with that, that anticipation of what is to come. But I'll I'll tell you. It was actually a little book. A little book entitled, Love Is. (laughs) She gave him a book about love and then broke his heart. (laughs) A little book called Love Is. You know, life is filled with ups and downs, with heartbreaks and headaches and hope. And one day, one day, all of these experiences, good, bad, and indifferent, will pale in comparison to the new reality that we will have in the eternal Christ. Because one day, all of those groanings, all of that frustration will be traded in for the goodness and the glory of Christ. And in that day, and from that day, for all of eternity, we will finally know and experience what love is. Because we will be engulfed in it eternity. 
And so the word today is to stand on your toes, to crane your neck, to get a glimpse of what is to come. A future reality that anchors our souls in great hope. Not because we think it could happen, but because we know if God said it's going to, we believe it. And one day we will not only know, but we will experience the full reality of being sons and daughters of the Most High. And so let that hope, let that promise, that reality, that vision inspire you to live right here and right now. If you need us to pray for you or encourage you, we'd love to do that. You can go to our website, edmundchurchofchrist.com, and go to the prayer page. I would also encourage you to go there sometimes and pray for others. You can fill out a prayer request there. If you're here today, you can come forward. Maybe today you're ready to give your life to Christ. You're tired of living according to the values and ways of the world. Jesus is calling you. And he gives us that blessed assurance of what is to come that anchors our souls. Let's stand and sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is